Hey everyone, I'm Mariana, this is Impression Blend, and welcome back to another monthly wrap-up. Today I'm going to be talking about everything I watched in July. We have quite a few things to talk about, so let's just get started. So before we get to all of the movies, I have a TV series to talk about, and that is Stranger Things Season 4. I finally watched Stranger Things Season 4. I am not okay. I am devastated. If you've seen it, you know why, but easily, easily the best season they have had. I cannot believe the comeback they made after season three. I don't know if you enjoyed season three. I was a little bit on the fence about it. I still liked it, but it wasn't as good as the previous two. But this one was amazing. They did so many things right. They stepped it up with the character development, with the horror, which I really appreciated. It's definitely the most horror season of them all. And they had a fantastic villain, by far the most interesting villain they've had on the show. I mean, is there really anyone out there who thought Vecna was a bad villain? I'm sure I'm gonna get someone in the comments now who's gonna be like, Vecna is the worst villain they've had on the show. I completely disagree. Please explain yourself if you think that because Vecna is so interesting. He has a backstory. He has motivations. He is creepy. He looks menacing. Big fan. Big fan of Vecna. I cannot wait for season five and to see how they wrap all of this up in their final season. My only real complaint was the Russia plotline and they definitely dragged that out as much as they could. Completely unnecessary in my opinion. I wasn't too interested in that plotline to begin with and I was waiting for it to wrap up somewhere at least in the middle of the season but no they dragged that out throughout the entire thing and every time it would cut back to that I would just be like, why? Why are we doing this? But everything else was great. I was so into it the entire time. I was so curious where they were taking it. Eddie, what an amazing, amazing character. He instantly went into my top three characters of this entire show. And what an insane epic finale. This is once again easily the best and the most epic finale they've had on the series. Very traumatizing, but still fantastic. And yeah, Stranger Things season four did not disappoint. If you still haven't seen it, if you're skeptical after season three, give it a try. You are most likely going to love it. If I were to rate this season, it would be a really high nine. If it wasn't for the Russia plotline, it would have been a 10. But as is, it is a very high nine out of 10. I have also been watching The Sandman, which is a Netflix series coming out next week. I I cannot say anything about it because I am not allowed to talk about it until the day of the release, but I have been screening it and we're definitely going to talk about it next week. But moving on to the movies, let's take a look at my letterbox, which is where I log and review everything I watch. If you don't follow me, I'm Impression Blend on there. And it has been a pretty busy month, a bit all over the place, but let's get started with the unbearable weight of massive talent. Now, I have been looking forward to this movie because it's a movie where Nicolas Cage plays a fictionalized version of Nicolas Cage. What a premise. And unfortunately, I was pretty let down. Now, I'm not trying to say that this was a terrible movie. This was just very middle of the road for me. It had its moments. It's entertaining enough to watch once, but... I just feel like they could have done so much more with it. They could have made it more interesting. They could have made it more entertaining. They could have used Nicolas Cage's personality more, which is my biggest letdown here, is that they underused Nicolas Cage in the movie about Nicolas Cage. Like, Nicolas Cage is a lot more interesting than what you might see from this movie. Watch any Nicolas Cage interviews, you will see. But here he is essentially going to a birthday party for money to a super fan's house and things get a little bit unexpectedly crazy for him. See, even that premise sounds like a lot of fun and you have Pedro Pascal as the super fan of Nicolas Cage. It should be an amazingly hilarious and entertaining movie and it just wasn't, unfortunately. It's medium amount of fun, which is why I gave it a 
six out of ten. Next, I watched The Lore, which is a Polish horror musical about mermaids who eat humans. Isn't that a lovely subject? This is actually a modern retelling of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. It is set in Poland in the 80s, and instead of following one mermaid, it revolves around two mermaid sisters who sing at a nightclub. Now, I get it. It sounds very out there, especially considering that this is a musical, and I wasn't sure if this was going to be my thing. It sounded like it could potentially be too weird even for me, but it wasn't. I was so on board with this. I, I really enjoyed this movie, actually. First of all, I generally love when fairy tales get the horror treatment because I think the combination of dark and whimsical is very interesting and not seen often enough. And I love it personally. It just works for me. And the lure definitely leans into the darkness in the sexuality of the story, which is not something we've seen in any Little Mermaid retail at least not the ones I've seen. Let me know if you've seen something different. It is a little bit uneven as far as the pacing goes, as far as what they choose to highlight in this story, and it does get a little bit too weird a few times, but overall I think the tone and the use of the setting is perfect and I really dug it. The two actresses who play the two mermaid sisters are wonderful. They're very different from one another, but they are both extremely memorable and enchanting in their own ways. If this sounds like something that might be interesting to you, I absolutely do recommend it. However, if you walk away from this thinking, what the hell did I just watch? This was way too weird for me. I completely understand it is one of those movies that it's just you're either going to be on board with it or you're just going to be absolutely 100% not on board with it. So yeah, for me, it was my kind of weird. I gave it an 8 out of 10 and I would actually probably watch it again. Yeah, I really did enjoy this. Next, I watched Hatching, which is a Finnish horror film, and it also has a little bit of a whimsical quality to it. It's about this family that is essentially obsessed with the image of perfection until the 12-year-old daughter finds a very strange egg, and things just go off the rails from there. The movie is pretty much about toxic parenting and female puberty. Those are the two main themes. They're very clear when you watch the movie. There are other things kind of floating around, but those two absolutely stand out the most. And honestly, I thought that this was something that could have been a really great short film that got dragged out into a feature film. I did really like what it was going for, and there was some really fun body horror, if you're into that. The performances were good. The kind of happy, rosy family aesthetic was also interesting, combined with the horror of it. But overall, once again, it just felt like that short film idea that was really great that got made into a feature-length film but really didn't need to. I did enjoy it though. I gave it a 7 out of 10. Next, I watched RRR, which is an Indian film that you can find on Netflix and it essentially combines all the genres. It's a musical, it's a historical action blockbuster, it's a friendship movie, it has a bit of a romance to it. I talked about this film in my uh, best movies of the year so far video, so I'm just going to direct you to that because I don't want to repeat myself and I don't really have anything more to add other than if you still haven't watched it, check it out. I know it sounds like a crazy movie and it sounds like people are trolling you, telling you to watch it. It's a really long three hour film, but it absolutely is worth it. And somehow all of that works and it's just a lot of fun. So check it out on Netflix. I gave it an eight out of 10. Next, I watched a documentary about Navalny. If you don't know who this is, Alexei Navalny is a Russian opposition leader and specifically a very outspoken critic of 
uh, the Russian Lord Voldemort that's currently in power. This documentary is very focused on the assassination attempt against Navalny. He got poisoned. He barely survived. If you don't know what happened, don't look it up. Just watch the documentary because it is a pretty insane story and it is a very well put together documentary. It did still feel a little bit surface to me. I felt like there was a lot more that they could have covered, but that might be because I am familiar with the story and there really wasn't that much new information in this documentary for me personally. There were some things, but uh, not all that much. But that's a me problem. I think for anybody who is not mega familiar with this story or doesn't know a lot about Navalny, this would be fascinating. And it's certainly an effective documentary the way it's made. There's a particularly great phone call scene in it. And it is something that never gets old. I have seen it before more than once. And I loved seeing it as a part of documentary. And I love that they actually included a lot of it in there. They could have easily cut cut it up into a smaller section, but they leave a lot of it in and that was great too. I ended up giving this an 8 out of 10. If you have HBO Max, it's streaming on there right now and it is absolutely worth your time. Next, I watched Incantation, which is another film that I talked about in my best movies of the year so far video, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically this is a found footage film that I found to be incredibly effective. It is easily the scariest film I saw all year. It has to do with a curse. It has to do with messing with your head and the way they use found footage actually makes sense. So really liked it, thought it was very good. I've seen some people who did not enjoy it at all, but I personally think it's one of the best of the year. I ended up giving it an eight out of 10. Then I saw Where the Crawdads Sing, which is a movie based on a best-selling novel that I couldn't even finish. I was hoping this movie would be better than the novel. And I think for someone like me, it was that being said, it, it's still not a great movie and I completely understand why it's rating on Rotten Tomatoes is what it is. The story is about Kaya who raises herself alone essentially in the marshes outside of a small town and as an adult she is being accused of murdering her somewhat boyfriend, uh, someone she was involved with. So it sounds like it's going to be kind of a coming of age story, kind of a courtroom drama slash murder mystery, and it is those things, but above all, this is a romance film. I cannot stress this enough. If you're thinking about seeing this, please realize, if you haven't read the book, this is very romance heavy. It is hard for me to review movies like this because it is very clearly not made for me. I am not the target audience of this movie. The target audience are people who watch similarly made movies, similarly romance heavy movies, people who really loved the book, which a lot of people did. They are definitely the primary audience here. I am not, and when I saw it, I thought it was going to play really well with the target audience, which it did, because if you look at the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, it is very high, and the critic score is pretty low, so that makes perfect sense for me. This movie is not great. It's not terrible. It's sometimes kind of cute. Other times it's pretty cringe. There's a lot about it that's very off its genre. There's definitely a love triangle. There's definitely a lead character who is somehow really good at a lot of things. And also despite raising herself in the marshes, in poverty, is somehow very clean, very put together, knows how to do her hair, knows how to do her makeup, is always wearing these cute little outfits. It's just, it's of its genre. It's not a terrible thing. It's just not a believable thing, but it is fine within this kind of movie. I am actually surprised they went the only in theaters route for this movie because it seems like something that should be on streaming. It would be perfect to put on streaming. It feels like a direct to streaming movie, if you know what I mean. 
but they went only in theaters with it, which I don't understand the decisions that are being made. That we'll talk about another movie uh, later in this wrap up that is going direct to streaming that absolutely should be in theaters. None of this makes sense to me, but this movie was okay. I, I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was awful, especially considering what it's supposed to be, but it wasn't amazing either. So a six out of 10, that might be a little high. It might be more of a five out of 10 movie, but I think because it's successful with its target audience, it deserves a six. Next, I watched Game Over, which is an Indian thriller slash horror drama. It's hard to classify this film because it is something that for a very long time is a psychological drama about PTSD with a bit of a supernatural angle to it, but it kind of is up to your interpretation at that point. It is not a major thing for a while. So for the first hour of this movie, I was just kind of sitting there wondering if this was mislabeled as a thriller horror film because it does not feel like for a straight hour of this film. It is a good psychological drama. It's very sad at points. And it does open with a pretty horrific thing, but the real thriller aspect does not kick in until about last 30 to 40 minutes. But when it does kick in, it means business. And then suddenly it's a whole different movie and there's an element to that last 30 to 40 minutes that you do not see coming. And it is kind of out of nowhere, but it's a lot of fun. I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to even tell you what that element is even remotely because it was such a cool thing to just see and it takes you by surprise and the way the film uses it is pretty fun considering the lead character. I know I'm being super vague, but if you want to watch something like that, if you've never seen an Indian horror film, which I haven't, this was a fun experience. I would definitely recommend it. I saw it on Netflix and I gave it a 7 out of 10. Then I saw X again. This is my third viewing of X, believe it or not. I was showing it to a friend. She really enjoyed it. And I, of course, really enjoyed it. One more time, I talked about this movie in that video that I keep mentioning about my favorite movies of the year so far. So check it out. You guessed it. Check out that video for more details. But X is just a really fun summer slasher. It knows what it's doing and I really appreciate it. Plus, apparently not only did they film the prequel already, but it's actually coming out this fall, which is absolutely crazy and a great surprise. The trailer looked like a lot of fun. If you haven't seen the trailer for Pearl, check it out. And I'm so excited to see it very soon, apparently. But yes, for the third time, I gave X an 8 out of 10. Next, I watched Girl in the Picture, which is a documentary that came out on Netflix this month, and it is an absolutely insane story. It is as crazy as it is heartbreaking, and the worst thing about it is that as you watch it, you just keep thinking, none of this should have happened. This shouldn't have been a story that exists, but unfortunately it does, and it's awful. But as a documentary, it's really good. The whole thing is a search for a person's identity, and you keep thinking that they finally figured out who this person was, and then you realize that there's another layer to the story and it's even more sad than the previous one. That is how I would describe Girl in the Picture. I was going into this thinking, oh my gosh, why am I even watching this? Another true crime documentary, which is going to be on Netflix with shocking reveals and... Uh, that's just gonna be it. I don't know if it's gonna bring anything new to the table. And it, honestly, it doesn't break any new ground in particular as far as the filmmaking goes, but the story of it and the interviews that they do are so 
absolutely crazy and fascinating, but also extremely dark and sad that I have to recommend it because you won't believe what you're hearing. Gave this one an 8 out of 10, a lot of 8 out of 10s this month, apparently. Then I rewatched The Host, not the terrible American host movie, oh no, the Bang Joon-ho film, The Host, which is a monster horror film. And this is a very special movie for me because this is where I was introduced to Korean cinema, to South Korean cinema, and that is where I fell in love and knew I needed to watch more. And what an introduction, a Bong Joon-ho film. So I haven't seen this in a long time, and I was wondering if it holds up still because you never know, tastes change, but it is really, really good. Plus, it has Song Kang-ho as the lead, I mean, it's perfect. It's a perfect introduction for me to Korean cinema, but also it's just a really smartly made horror film that has ruined most monster horror films for me. People wonder why I don't enjoy monster horror films. It's because of the host. Basically, a bunch of toxic waste gets dumped into the river, and then the river produces this mutated fish, monster, whatever, something, and it begins attacking the people that are living in this town, and it specifically focuses on a family. So it is a family story, it is a monster story, and there is a lot of social commentary in there as well. As we know, Bong Joon-ho loves doing that in his movies, and this one does not disappoint. I will say, out of all of his films, this is the one where the humor throws me off the most, because it will go from these pretty horrific scenes to something that is over the top and clearly ridiculous. And I know this is by design and it is meant to have a certain effect, but it just, it's so jarring for me to watch when we're jumping between horror and comedy and there is some real darkness in this film as well. So it is a very interesting one to watch if you haven't seen it, obviously highly recommend and I once again gave this an 8 out of 10. Then I watched Magnolia for the first time. It was such a random watch for me. I've been meaning to see this movie for so long, never got around to watching it, and I just decided to do it on a whim, which is not how you should approach Magnolia. I was not prepared for this film. And what was so beautiful about it is that I was not spoiled on a single thing in it. And if you've seen Magnolia, you know what I'm talking about. A lot of people have been spoiled on that thing towards the end. I was just sitting there thinking, what the hell just happened, movie? Now, Paul Thomas Anderson tends to be a very hit or miss director for me. This, however, is instantly my favorite film that he has ever made. I love the way he approached the complexity and messiness of humans and how much this film had to do with empathy and reckoning with the past and just the acceptance of self. I found it interesting how many people in their reviews mentioned that this is focused on the effects of trauma and yes that is part of it but I did not see this as a dark film. I actually saw this as a very optimistic but very emotional film. I cried so many times watching Magnolia and all of these performances are just so Oscar worthy. I cannot believe these people weren't nominated. I loved all of the storylines. If you don't know what it's about, it's kind of hard to explain because you have a bunch of characters that are in some way connected to each other and it's a bit chaotic for a while. I was not sure about it for the first, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes and then it starts coming together and you start realizing how everything's connected, why PTA decided to do it this way and it is absolutely brilliant and so powerful. Obsessed with this movie, just an instant favorite. I hate saying things like that. I hate saying something is an instant favorite because that's just not how I treat favorites. But sometimes you see a movie and you just know, and Magnolia was one of them. Holy shit, what a film. Absolutely the easiest 10 out of 10 I gave this year to 
anything. It is a masterpiece. Then, as you can see, I went on a bit of a Jordan Peele binge and I watched Us, Get Out, and I screened Nope. Nope, I have a separate review for, so I'm just not going to talk about it. You can watch that review and get all of my thoughts there. But I wanted to watch, to re-watch his previous two films just to see how things compare. And I'm just going to rank them for you right now. At the top, I have Get Out. It is still my favorite Jordan Peele film. Next, I have Us. I really do like Us. I know people seem to be pretty split on Us, which I did not realize until now. I thought we all agreed Us was a really good movie, but I guess not. I am a fan. And then in third place, I have Nope. Now, I do not dislike Nope, as some people have interpreted my score. I gave it a 7 out of 10. That is not a bad score. I liked the movie, and there's a lot about it that I appreciated. I found it interesting, but watch my review to find out what's going on with that. But out of the three, Nope was definitely my least favorite. Get Out is a film that just gets better and better on every viewing for me. I think it's just so well written, it's so clever. There's so many little details that come through every time you watch it. I learn something new about this film every time I see it. And it is, there's just no contest about which one for me is the best film that Jordan Peele has made. Us is an interesting one. I think it's the one that is the scariest of the three. It is easily the most obvious horror film in his filmography, and I think it's very effective as a horror film as well. However, as far as the writing goes, it's definitely weaker than Get Out, and in my experience, it is at its most interesting on your first viewing. It's not that it gets worse on repeat viewings. It's still good. It's still interesting. It's still a good movie. But with Get Out, I like it more and more every time I watch it. And with Us, I liked it the most the first time I watched it, if that makes sense. So Get Out is a 9 out of 10. Us is an 8 out of 10. And Nope is a 7 out of 10. Go check out my review. I do have an old review for Get Out as well, where I gave it an 8. So that just tells you that this movie has improved for me. Then I decided to finally watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This is also related to Nope. That's all I'll say about that. But this was my first viewing of this film, believe it or not. And I just cannot imagine what it was like Seen it in theater back in 1977, it must have been an absolutely mind-blowing experience and I'm honestly a little bit envious of people who got to experience it that way because while it's still a fantastic looking film as far as all of the sci-fi stuff goes, it definitely does not have the same mind-blowing effect anymore. It is really good. I really enjoyed the film, but there are things about it that feel very dated. I think the performances are very dated, and also the writing feels not as tight as you would expect from a sci-fi movie right now. Now, this is not to say that I need sci-fi movies to be super action-packed. If you know what kind of sci-fi movies I like, you know that's not true, but... In this movie in particular, everything that has to do with people talking in rooms and making plans was very uninteresting to me, and I felt like a lot of that could have been condensed or cut. I know people are going to disagree, I know this is a big favorite for people, but for me this just wasn't all that interesting and I couldn't wait until we got to the exciting stuff, because the exciting stuff, the alien stuff, the sci-fi stuff is so awesome. Everything that had to do with the family and the actual UFO was fantastic, even though some of these things were also a little bit dated. I loved them, but there was so much of this serious people talking in rooms stuff that it was really distracting me from the good parts of this movie. I think I expected a little bit too much from this film, to be honest, because it's such a big favorite. It's such a famous classic that in my mind, I've built this up to a ridiculous standard. And I still ended up really enjoying it. As you can see, I gave it an 8 out of 10. And I'm so glad I finally experienced this classic. But I wanted it to be 
a new favorite for me and it just wasn't. It was a really good film that I really appreciated with some really awesome sci-fi stuff. Then I unfortunately watched The Gray Man, which I'm not super excited to talk about. I just, I was so bored throughout this film, which is unfortunate because it's a spy action thriller. I like those. It has a great cast. It has Chris Evans, it has Ryan Gosling, and it has Ana de Armas and some supporting cast that is really good too. It just, it wasn't doing it for me. It was so bland. The writing was very questionable and it had no business costing as much money as it costs. Some of the effects look so questionable as well. What did they spend their $200 million on? I have no idea. Salaries, maybe, who knows? The best thing about this film, easily, is Chris Evans as the villain. He is ridiculous in it, and he knows the kind of movie that he's in, but that means that he sells every single ridiculous line that he has to say and he is over the top in the right way. I need Chris Evans as more villains because he is just so good in that role and he's clearly having so much fun with this as the anti-Captain America thing, let's call it that. As a movie, I did not enjoy The Gray Man. I thought it was very awkward. I would have preferred if it was straight up a comedy. I think it would have worked better that way because everybody else was so serious. Ryan Gosling does have a few moments of comedy that made me laugh, but overall, this was just, this movie took itself way too seriously considering the plot. I cannot recommend this to you unless you just really want to see Chris Evans as a villain, which that part I do recommend, but other than that, no, don't waste your time. And I ended up giving it a five out of 10. This is a very, very meh spy action thriller. After that, I watched Resurrection, which kind of came out in theaters this weekend, but not really. Good luck finding it. It's going to be available on video on demand next weekend, which is where I suggest you watch it because this movie is absolutely insane. So Resurrection is starring Rebecca Hall. It is about Margaret. She's a single mother of a teenager and a successful independent woman. She is unexpectedly, unexpectedly faced with someone from her past and with trauma from her past and her life kind of begins to fall apart. Now, Margaret is somebody who is very determined to keep everything under control, and so because her life is beginning to fall apart, she is willing to do anything to regain control and protect her daughter. Here are some things you need to know about this film. First of all, Rebecca Hall is Oscar worthy in this movie. Rebecca Hall has done some amazing performances throughout her career, specifically in thrillers as well. I mean, last year's The Night House was excellent, but this is her best and most intense performance. She's intense emotionally. She's intense as she delivers her lines. This is a physical performance that's very impressive. She is so good in this role. It is worth watching this film just for her performance alone, but there's more to this film than just the performance. The second thing you need to know is that if you saw the trailer, it is a lot more twisted, sinister, thrilling, and messed up than the trailer makes it seem. The trailer kind of makes it look like your average psychological thriller slash stalker film, and that's kind of all there is to it. It is, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm not gonna say, any specifics, but just trust me, it is a lot more intense and a lot more messed up and a lot more of a horror film than you might think after watching the trailer. And the last thing that you need to know is that this movie is utterly insane in some parts. I mean, there is an element to it that I still don't know how to process. It kind of goes off the rails a little bit, I'm not gonna lie. And I think the ending is going to alienate some viewers and people are gonna be like, this is way too far, this is crazy stuff, I don't know what to do with this, the ending has ruined the movie for me. It is a movie that you should watch if you are a fan of twisted psychological horror films. 
Check it out when you can. I ended up giving it an eight out of 10. A lot of that is because of Rebecca Hall's performance because she is that amazing in the movie. Finally, the last two movies that I saw in July are Bodies, 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 which is an A24 Gen Z slasher horror film and Prey, which is a prequel to Predator. I can't really talk about either of those. They're not out yet, so... I will probably make separate short reviews for these. There are a lot of movies coming out in the next two weeks, so I have to kind of pick and choose what I want to do a full video on and what I want to do some short reviews on. So these seem like good ones to do short reviews for, and you will hear my opinion and my rating on both of these. I will say right now, just as a reaction, that I enjoyed both of them one more than the other. And Prey is the one that I was talking about earlier when I said it makes no sense for it to go directly to streaming. This movie should have been seen on the big screen. It is just, it's such a shame that they are putting it on Hulu or on Disney Plus, depending on where you live. This should be in theater, and unfortunately it's not. But yes, I do recommend both of these. I think both of them are movies that deserve to be seen, and I will talk about both of them a little bit more later. And that is it for this wrap up. Let me know what you have been watching in July. Let me know how upset you were after watching Stranger Things season four, because I'm still thinking about it. I'm still very salty about what happened, but I hope you guys are having an awesome day and I will see you very soon in my next video. Bye.